there have been great women in the history of computer science. Everyone knows about Ada Lovelace, so I'm going to skip ahead to the first computer. It was called the ENIAC, and it was developed on the US Army during the World War II project. And for some time, the women that are in those pictures, they were thought to be models. But they were not. They were the first software programmers reported. And they learned to program without programming languages, without manuals or any tool, because none of that existed. By the time they were finished, the ENIAC ran a ballistic trajectory perfectly. But then came Ray Hopper, and she wrote the first compiler. And then she did a programming language called Flowmatic. And then she contributed to create the prolog. Oh, God, well, sorry. And her importance is so big that still nowadays, we're calling back what she first recorded her on her notebook. And then we can mention Margaret Hamilton, who wrote the source code for the onboard flight software for the Apollo 11 mission. Women make a big impact on the computer science, but also in Ireland. And that's what I'm here to tell today. My name is Miriam Pena, and I was born up there in the northwest of Spain in an area called Galicia. That's where I studied my computer science degree on La Coruña University. And I've been doing Erlang for 10 years. At the moment, I work as a staff engineer in Arbol in San Francisco. And as Francesco says, we, we serve ads. We, we actually bid to serve one million ads per second. And if you want to get in touch with me, you can use my Twitter handle. Uh, you want to tweet about this, please do. I would love if you could be very, very loud out there. And this is the moment when everyone shows a picture or a cat or a dog, and this is all I have. <laughs> so my passion is a scalable distributed systems. That's what I love, that's what I studied. And, and unless you live in the Bay Area or here in Stockholm, you don't often find this kind of projects in your hometown, especially if you are from the northwest of Spain. So there I found myself uh, on my professional career traveling all around the world. I've worked and lived in countries as different as Egypt or Ireland and, and Sweden as well, and USA. And I work in many industries. I use Erlang for reading data from solar power stations. I use it for reading, monitoring data on vehicles, on chat servers, in the ad industry, and many more. And you might wonder why I'm here. Why is he here? The truth is, um, last November I was selected uh, as one of uh, the female staff engineers to watch in 2018 by Women 2.0. And that was great. I, like, I didn't work. Who doesn't like it? <laughs> but I didn't really thought about it too much until a couple of weeks later, I went to Spain on a Christmas holiday, and that history got picked up by, by press. And over the course of three weeks, I appeared over 15 times in radio and newspapers, even on TV. And, and that was hard, <laughs> because up until that moment, I was trying to be as invisible as possible from every one of you, from everyone. <laughs> Like, I didn't blog, I didn't tweet, I open source stuff, but I don't give it publicity, I don't, didn't do any public speaking. Basically, I was trying to be invisible. But it was so worth it. Because Erlang was presented as a language that brings successful careers. You get to work with really smart people in really complex problems. But also, and maybe more important, maybe, a lot of people wrote to me. They said that their young boys or the young girls were inspired by my history. Especially young girls said that they saw me on TV and now they wanted to, to, be, to do a career in tech, that they wanted to travel the world and they wanted to do back-end engineer. And it almost felt like doing, like software engineer was not a weird career choice for a young lady.
And I realized I could have an impact on people. And that got me thinking, what can I do? How can I encourage the young ladies to be the nerd next, next nerd in school, to become the new inventors? And this is how the idea of this talk started. Like, let's talk, let's go back to my area of expertise, which is Ireland. Why not talk about the women in Ireland? I mean, looking at this, it might feel like there's not so many, but there's actually a lot of them, and we've done a few things. So this is why I'm here to tell, here to talk about the unsung heroes of the Ving. And for this, let's go back in time. <laughs> Wait, a little bit further back. Let's take a peek at 1984. 1984 was the year in which the first Macintosh, the first personal computer came out. It was also the year of the first TED Talk, and it was a disaster. It didn't work out, and that's why they didn't try again for another six years. It was also the year in which the Motorola launched the first mobile device, a device so small that you could actually fit in your pocket. It was a 6 6. <laughs> 80s. But also, on the south of Stockholm, somewhere, I'm not sure, <laughs> there was a, a little laboratory in Elhe in which a, a group of people believed that no language was well suited for telecom system development. And they suggested to create a software laboratory to research and to create a new language for it. And this, and this document, this document, this document marks the creation, marks the moment in which the software laboratory, the CS Lab, the laboratory in which Ireland was born, uh, was founded. And if you look closely at the top, you can see that this is signed by Eva Salomonson, which was the manager that supported and headed the department which the CS Lab belonged to. And now that we have a laboratory, and we have a budget, and we have a job description, what do we do? What do we do with all this situation? What? We spend the budget. <laughs> and how? We hire people. <laughs> and this is how our friends <laughs> join the picture. Um, and for a while, they were doing a bunch of programming prototypes in pretty much any programming language that was available at that time. They chose Prolog, or they, they, ad they actually added processes on top of Prolog, and Erlang was born, just in 1987. So now that we have a language, we need uh, some users to use that language. And this is when uh, Sersling joined um, Joined the picture. She had um, she had a uh, like a t they, uh, like she wanted to uh, uh, prototype and as she wanted to build a system architecture in layer, and they needed a language to the, to build that. So they got in touch with Bjorne, and they agreed that we'll cooperate over nine months. Basically, she wanted to do a basic operating system layer and application system layer on top, and they chose to do it in Ireland, which was. Very exotic at that time, I believe. <laughs> and over the course of nine months, they, both teams were cooperating. They will meet twice a week, and they will propose a new syntax to the language. If they like the syntax, they stay. If they didn't like the syntax, after trying for a couple of days, they will take it out. And the fact that the language was changing literally every other day didn't really bother them too much. <laughs> and after these nine months, we have a report. And this is the actual report. <laughs> And they have two conclusions. The first one is that the combination between this architectural layer and the fact that we did it in Erlang instead of Flex, both things com combined, make a performance improvement in ten, like what would you do in 20 time, 22 times uh, with one programmer in Plex and the old architecture, you would do it in one time with uh, Erlang and this new architecture. Basically, it was 20 time, 22 times faster to develop a product, which was a bit polemic, like no one really believed it. <laughs> so eventually, they just lowered the number to a random number, which is three, which means it's so much better than before, but it's still something that they could actually believe on. 
But there was a second conclusion. Erlang needed to be faster. Erlang wasn't fast enough running on top of Prolog. And this is when uh, Joe went back to study, and they were doing some research, they were reading some papers, they were reading abstracts, uh, to try to figure out how to do a new virtual machine. And actually, they were stopped for a while. But eventually, the new one came in C, and this one was 70 times faster. Yay! <laughs> but there's always a but. We need to work on it. <laughs> uh, but honestly, like having a, your own virtual machine was so cool. There was so much to do with it uh, that they just they just leave that like they were aware of that there was a performance problem, but they wouldn't invest more time right away on it. But as the computer programming, concurrent programming in Erlang first edition book says, without Carl Thurston and her project, Erlang would have never achieved that level of quality. And some ideas from that prototype went straight into OTP. So thank you, Cersei. That's okay. And we go on with this story, Erland's case is CS Lab. Um, there was this international switching symposium happening. Everyone's so excited about it. They've been preparing it for months. They were preparing documentation. They, they basically wanted to present Erland to the world for the first time. And they even hire people to have a stall at the trade, fa the trade fair, and they run out of clock demonstrations. And this is a picture of everyone in the garden. And there is one woman in the crowd, which is the first woman that work in the CS lab as a software engineer. And her name is Inge Marie Johnson. She was doing some prototypes on user interfaces. And in particular, she presented this one to you could use to make a phone call with um, on a system called interviews. But her, her something she did, which was very, very important, was the connection with the Uppsala University. She did her master there, so she had a really good relationship with the people. Uh, so they got in touch with them to see if some people could uh, do their thesis in Ireland, and Bjarne, of course, accepted the, the deal. And eventually, they have 20 students doing their thesis in Ireland, who most of them, I think, believe then the, um, the people from this, I, what's the name? Systems? The other department. Yeah. Systems. Uh, system. Uh, systems, yes. Later on, there was another prototype. Um, uh, this one from Janine Keffel. <laughs> Swedish names are so hard. <laughs> <laughs> I practice, actually. <laughs> um, so this one was carried out by another Ericsson unit. Uh, and, and there were a team of 13 people. Uh, six of each were women. It was an amazing ratio of women there. And they created this prototype in surprisingly short time. And the story of this could be another talking itself, so I'm not going to get into <laughs> all the <laughs> things that were around it. But the thing is that the fact that they developed this product so fast had such an uh, important effect on persuading management that Erland was a viable technology that it did led the decision to set up uh, a project to make Erland into indu of a, of a product of indu industrial quality, which is the Erland industrialization project. And who is the woman next to Janine? <laughs> She's Katrin Rambon. She was the leader of the Erlang Industrialization Project around 95. And she also became the manager of Erlang OTP for a while and also is the head of Ericsson Research. And as part of the industrialization project, there's a lot, uh, lot of things happen. Uh, for instance, we have to make the documentation uh, for the launch of, of the OTP one, the first version of Erlang. This was a call, the system of reviews. It was a really big book, like 60 pages, and it was used to market Erlang uh, inside Ericsson. Um, and then there is an anecdote from that Francesco told me once. Uh, he entered a room where Joe was, and Joe picked up the book, and he says, have you seen this? This is brilliant. It does not say anything of technical value whatsoever. But management love it. 
We need more of this. <laughs> It's one of the first times he realized that uh, not only your product has to be great, you also need to be able to sell it. And this document uh, was by Anna Federiv, um, the first technical writer that the OTP, or the, that the CS Lab had. And, and she did many documents. Uh, we have uh, different versions of that. We have different brochures to sell us Erlang outside the, as the, to the outside world. I mean, the whole goal was to uh, have a programming uh, like uh, Erlang and all the support systems, the documentation and the brochures, so you could sell, pack it and sell it to companies. And as Francesco says, Anna was the first person who produced non-technical marketing material that management understood. Prior to that, it was Erlang the movie style. <laughs> she changed all that. Thank you, Anna. And of course, if the goal is to sell Erlan outside Ericsson, we need salespeople. And this is when Jane entered the picture. Uh, Jane was a computer science groupie at Stanford, uh, where she did her BA. And then she moved to Sweden, and she needed a job. So she joined Ericsson to sell Erlan. And this is how we entered 1998. This is 20 years ago. And at that moment, Erlang was used within Ericsson for GPRS, for ATM suites. It was the products that were successful. And Erlang was spreading, uh, partially with non-disclosure agreements, partially that it was being sold to companies. And suddenly, Erlang was not allowed to be used within Ericsson radio. This means that uh, new product development was not allowed to use be using Erlang. And if you had a product that was using Erlang, you were highly encouraged to s migrate to a different technology. And when the Ericsson Radio CTO became Ericsson CTO, Erlang was doomed. Like uh, flying the Erlang flag was something that you were not willing to do within Ericsson. And this was a surprise because Erlang was proved to be a suitable uh, technology for large-scale projects. And so why did this happen? It was hard to sell outside. Um, there was so much open source code by that time that people wasn't, like companies wasn't willing to pay for, for a language. It was also hard to convince people within Ericsson to learn a technology that they could only use within Ericsson. Just think about it, like would you, would you be willing to use a language, learn a language that you can only use in your current employment? This is hard. And also they had bad experiences with previous programming languages because it was really hard to maintain and to just your own libraries. So it, it actually makes some sense that they discourage. And things got hairy. People got mad. Of course they will. Because it was so if it was hard to sell Erlan before, now that it, it is not allowed, it will be even harder. And, and, the and the fact is that Ericsson wanted Erlang spread. They've been trying for five years. And so the solution was just to give it away, make it open source. And when Netscape suddenly they released the source code of Mozilla browser, it became apparent that even large companies were willing to release free source code. So they have to argument. And Erlang needed to be that too. Because no matter how good your software is, if the internet is not interested, is going to be dead. And then Jane moved to the, to the CS lab. And the idea of open source was created, and Jane made it happen. She started loving the management committee that was responsible for airline development to persuade and approve an open source release. The first principal argument is that it will be easier to recruit people in Ireland if, they have, if you could use it outside the company. My main concern was the patents, but finally it was sorted out, and Erlang was open source in 1998. It took one year to make that happen. It was so hard. It was so hard to get there, and people couldn't believe it. Like the minute it was out there open source, people would just start downloading it with the right license because they were concerned that they would take it away. And in my opinion, 
uh, the the fact that they discouraged the use of Erlang within Ericsson was the best thing that happened to the language because it was a kick in the ass to make it spread. <laughs> and then I did this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Do I play? Does it work? Yeah. Okay. So then a group of people and people uh, at, at the CS lab is, uh, were trying to figure out how to make money out of Erlang. And they, did they came to the conclusion that uh, it was to do programs at, outside Ericsson. So 11 people from the CS lab, uh, Jane included, uh, left and created Blue Tail, uh, CS chief executive. And they decided to use Erlang as a programming language. They created the Mail Robustifier and 18 months later, the company was sold for a 152 million dollars. 18 months, 152 millionaires. Just saying. <laughs> and then that money was used to found Klarna. And this was great because, like, on, on one hand, money from Blue Tail was used to create new companies, not only this one, but on the other hand. Companies were more eager to use Erlang after this success case. Like, it would be easier to convince management that it was the right technology. And as Joe Arts just says, Jan is one of the unsung heroines of the Erlang history. She knew all sorts of things like how to start a company, how to raise venture capital, how to write a contract, how to sell software, things that we knew nothing about. We would not be here today if it were not for her. She was hired to sell the language, but she ended up saving it from extinction. Thank you, Jane. And what happened at Ericsson? Well, that discouragement was never lifted. It was just forgotten. And I'm going to talk about a few of the women who were in the OTP team. There were many women. I'm just going to talk about three. The first one is Gunilla. Um, well, she's been doing Erlang development for 25 years. I believe 3D <laughs> prototyping, 4D, and 5D. And she was a project manager of the OTP team uh, between 1999 and 2007. Then we have Siri. This is the best picture you can find from her on the internet, and I tried. <laughs> She's been 15 years in the OTP team, a little bit more in Ericsson, and she's done so much uh, for many things. And she's involved, like she did the new logging API, she's involved with release handwriting behaviors, common tests. Who doesn't use common tests here every day? Is anyone not using common tests here? Anyone? Yeah, prove it. Who has heard about the efficiency guide before? Who has ever read about the efficiency guide? The first version was by Angela Anding. She's been 20 years at Ericsson, 15 years at the OTP team, and she's really active. Like, if you download the source code of Erlang and you order by blame, she will be the sixth one in lines of code, and the f she's the fourth one in number of commits. She's right there. And she's been doing basically all the things related to SSL, TLS, crypto, and a lot more, <laughs> like Inets and ODBC, Jane State, and, and so much. So when I started this journey, I was concerned I would not find enough people to talk about. After all, you don't see many women in these conferences. And when some people find out I was going to do this, they did not understand why. And others said my credibility as a software engineer will be compromised if I start talking about these topics. And that's a price I'm going to have to pay. The thing is that after months of research, I'm swamped with information. They have barely started telling these stories. But if I had time, I could talk about so many things. I could talk about how Erlang research is led by women. Women like Natalia Cecina, 
on the scalability of Erlang, Melinda thought would refactor L, Hinkenling. I would talk about Anna Nisberg um, founding the Elixir Bridge. Doing podcasts is really active on the Elixir community in in USA. I would talk about the Victoria photos with one bat, with Wicking Leaf, with Laura Castro, Clara Benak, I mean, so many women. <laughs> and, uh, but I don't have time. I asked Francesco for more time, but he said we need to wrap up. <laughs> So I'm going to have to delegate this on you. I'm going to need you to talk these stories, to talk about them. Today we're honored to have some of these women with us in the audience. Please join us. <laughs> You have them, the unsung heroes, women that use Erlang when no one else did it before, that created the ecosystem, that researched on it, that they did a master thesis on it, that open source it. Join me thanking them. Thank you. So 1984, the year in which this talk started, was also the year in which the percent of women in tech started to decrease. By 1960s, 37% of people graduating in computer science degrees were women. And nowadays, we barely reach 17%. So there's something we all need to work on. We need to change the numbers. We need to change the stat. We need to encourage the young ladies to get into tech. We need to show them that they fit in this industry. And in order to get to here, there's something that these young ladies need us to do. They need us to hire women. They need us to make them grow. They need us to sponsor their work, to encourage them to talk, to be visible, to do public speaking, because we can need to create the role models that will help grow a more diverse community. Those young women need them to be the new generation of role models that they can look up to. Thank you. 